Here are a few people who really should just stop making their own decisions. Number 5. Billy McFarland and Ja Rule Billy McFarland promised his customers a once-in-a-lifetime experience. And in that regard, he absolutely delivered on his promise. It's highly unlikely fire festival goers will ever feel so let down again in their lives when they go to another giant music festival. To understand how poorly fire festival was executed, it's important to understand what McFarland was promising. McFarland, a 25-year entrepreneur of sorts, teamed up with Ja Rule to create a luxury music festival on the island of Great Exuma in the Bahamas. Have you ever heard of Ja Rule being a great event planner? Yeah, things already aren't off to a great start. The promotions made it seem pretty awesome. Videos on Instagram showed bikini-clad models such as Kendall Jenner hanging out on a yacht. Artists like Major Lazer and Blink-182 were supposed to headline the event. There would be gourmet food, beachside champagne service, luxury villas, yachts, the whole nine yards. And then some all on a private beach on a beautiful island. Tickets were being sold for thousands of dollars. So what could go wrong? Answer? Everything. When people started showing up, there was no luxury housing. There was no gourmet food. There was no champagne. There were no half-naked models, and there certainly wasn't anything resembling Blink-182 or Major Lazer. As it turns out, the organizers spent all of their money on models and other unnecessary things such as yachts and private planes for the organizers to party on and had no money left to provide any of the stuff they promised. They also didn't do important things like uh, pay the bands or do any real planning. According to some working on the festival, McFarland, Ja Rule, and their inner circle didn't even start planning until late February, which, as it turns out, isn't nearly enough time to prepare for something this big. When festival goers arrived on the island, they found that the beach wasn't private at all. In fact, the festival site was simply a rocky stretch of beach next to a sandals resort. The luxury housing was just a bunch of tents that probably came from a FEMA camp. The gourmet food turned out to be cheese slices on bread and a sad excuse for a salad. And the bands were nowhere to be found since, you know, fire didn't pay them. Flights going in and out were delayed, so people who were unlucky enough to actually make it there were stuck on the island for a while with little food or water and no first aid or security in case something went wrong. And with social media being what it is, it was all chronicled on Twitter and Instagram. It was absolute chaos. When the dust settled, the 25-year-old McFarland tried to blame the lack of infrastructure on the island for the debacle. However, that doesn't explain the absence of all the things he promised. And now he's being sued, along with Ja Rule and other festival organizers, for hundreds of millions of dollars. On top of that, he neglected to pay a customs duty tax for the few supplies he did manage to import to the beach. So he's also in trouble for that. According to people who worked on the festival, McFarland and others knew for a while that they wouldn't be able to pull off the type of event they promised, but still decided to move forward with it anyway, with disastrous results. According to one lawsuit, McFarland and fire folks even sent out cease and desist letters to those criticizing the event. And as if he wasn't already enough of a joke, McFarland is making plans for the 2018 Fire Festival and even offered disappointing 2017 festival goers free VIP tickets for 2018 in lieu of a refund. Should anyone really give him a second chance here? Since his first startup, Magnesis, hasn't been giving customers what they paid for and it's pretty much setting investor money on fire as well. Number 4. The Penn State Frat Guys Generally speaking, frat dudes already don't have an awesome reputation. While that may not always be the fairest thing in the world, there are certainly instances that perpetrate that reputation. Take the recent incident at Penn State, for example. After a hazing incident that killed one of their newest pledges, 18 of the dudes from Beta Theta Pi fraternity were charged with the killing. On February 2nd, 2017, Timothy Piazza was participating in hazing at Frat when he consumed what's been described as a life-threatening amount of alcohol. These guys clearly exhibited no control during their drinking games. The drinking game the pledges were participating in is called the Gauntlet. It's where pledges form a line and take swigs from a bottle of vodka and pass it down until it's empty. 
Then they run around to different drinking stations where they do more drinking, such as chug wine from a bag or shotgun a beer. Basically, the whole idea is to force pledges to drink an insane amount of alcohol. 19-year-old Piazza was so wasted that he stumbled down the stairs of the frat house on not one, but two separate occasions. During his falls, he ruptured his spleen and fractured his skull. As he lay passed out, video surveillance of the party showed that leaders of the frat were seen ordering other junior members not to call an ambulance, even using physical force to stop members from calling for medical help. Clearly, they were scared they'd get in trouble. Even as Piazza's skin turned gray, they still ignored him and left him lying on a couch. It wasn't until nearly 11 a.m. the next morning that they called an ambulance, 12 hours after his first fall. Sadly, it was too late. Piazza passed away on February 4, 2017. Aside from the involuntary manslaughter charge, frat members are being charged with 50 counts of hazing and reckless endangerment dating back to 2016. Apparently, their stupidity wasn't relegated to just one night. So, basically, they figured that leaving a passed out person with a serious head injury passed out on the couch was a totally okay thing to do. They also were stupid enough to physically intimidate any frat member who tried to call an ambulance, which was used as evidence against them. These guys deserve whatever sentence they get. Number 3. Martin Shkreli Just look at him. If there's one person who's got a punchable face, it's this dude. He once bought the only copy of an unreleased Wu-Tang Clan album for $2 million and threatened to destroy it. But that's hardly the worst of his transgressions. The entrepreneur and former CEO of Turing Pharmaceuticals became unpopular when his company raised the price of Daraprim, an AIDS drug, by 5,556%. Shkreli founded Turing Pharmaceuticals back in 2015. On August 10, 2015, in accordance with Shkreli's business plan, Turing acquired Daraprim, a medication approved by the FDA in 1953 from Impax Laboratories for 55 million US dollars. The drug's most prominent use as of late, 2015, was as a anti-malarial, a anti-parasitic, and in conjunction with leucovrin and sulfadiazine, an AIDS drug. The patent for Daraprim had expired, but no generic version was available. The Turing Impacts deal included the condition that Impacts removed the drug from regular wholesalers and pharmacies. In June 2015, two months before the sale to Turing was announced, Impacts switched to tightly controlled distribution. In keeping with its strategy for pricing in the face of limited competition, Turing maintained the closed distribution. Turing raised the price of a dose of the drug in the U.S. market overnight from $1,350 to $750 U.S. dollars a pill, which basically left anyone in critical need of the pill in a price-gouging situation, which is basically a really sh** and dumb way to do business. Because of the Daraprim debacle, people were pretty happy when this pharma bro was arrested for securities fraud. As it turns out, he was misleading investors by overstating the value of his companies, such as MSMB Capital Management. So, whether it's defrauding investors out of tons of money, basically committing felonies, hiking up the prices of important medication, or blowing $2 million to show just because he can, Shkreli just can't seem to show off how big of a douchebag that he is. Number 2. Octomom Generally speaking, it's not anyone's business to tell a woman how many kids she should have. However, reason and common sense should still be applied by the woman making these decisions. Enter Octomom, someone who's in serious need of a life coach. Her real name is Natalie Sulman, a woman who wanted a lot of things, but didn't want to be the one to be responsible for her own decisions. Octomom wanted kids, a lot of them in fact. After many failed attempts having kids with her husband, she got a divorce and went the in vitro fertilization route, better known as IVF. But 14 kids later, really, just stop. After six kids, she gave birth to the octuplets, which is eight more kids at once in case you didn't know. Once the public found out she already had six other kids, all conceived through the use of IVF, and that she was on government assistance, opinions quickly turned against her, which was a sign that there was still some common sense left in the U.S. at the time. 
the whole situation was pretty controversial and sparked a lot of debate regarding assisted reproductive technology. It even led to Dr. Kamrava, the doctor who was in charge of the IVF, losing his medical license. Beyond the controversy surrounding their conception, Octomom has been heavily criticized since she's had a hard time providing for her kids, which is completely deserved in her case. As if that's not enough, she decided to exploit her kids and expose them to all kinds of public scrutiny when she signed a deal for a reality show, even though it would help her earn some money to better take care of her kids. Somehow, even after signing that deal, she filed for bankruptcy in 2012 claiming she had only $50,000 in assets while having more than $1 million in debt. In order to stay in the spotlight and take advantage of her 15 minutes, she appeared in a porno film later that year called Octomom Home Alone. Ugh, classy. In 2014, she was convicted of welfare fraud when she failed to disclose $30,000 of earnings she received from public appearances and photo shoots. Reportedly, she's gone back to working as an adult entertainer to provide money for her kids. Now, I understand people wanting to have kids, but having kids is just like having a certain lifestyle. If you can't afford it, don't do it. At the end of the day, Octomom decided to take on 14 little million dollar liabilities and deciding to let the government take responsibility. <sighs> Number one, Mario Balotelli. Mario Balotelli is pretty damn good at what he does. With more than 80 career goals and an impressive career with the Italian national team, his talent on the field is pretty much indisputable. But his decisions off the field, however, are a different story. The following bizarre behaviors are things this dude has actually done. He once drove to a woman's prison to quote, have a look around. I don't know, maybe he has some sort of weird fantasy? He once fired a pistol into the air in public. For some unknown freaking reason, he once started throwing darts at a youth team. Then there was the time he stopped off at a local high school just to use the bathroom. He left right after doing his business. Actually, this one makes total sense. But listen to this bathroom story. In 2011, he accidentally burned down his bathroom when he and his friend shot fireworks inside the house. That little debacle caused uh, 400,000 pounds of damage in his 3 million pound mansion. He also seems to be really bad at parking. When he moved to Manchester to play for Manchester City, he had no regard for their parking laws and amassed around $10,000 worth of parking tickets. His Maserati was impounded 27 times. Another time, one of his young fans complained to Bellatelli that he was being bullied at school. So, Balotelli shows up at school to confront the bully. This is actually a good story though, and a pretty nice thing to do. Apparently, he does a few of those as well, such as giving $1,000 to a homeless guy after he won $25,000 in a casino. Of course, he is also pretty well known for some of his on-field antics, such as stomping on other players' heads. In 2012, he stomped on Scott Parker's head during a game against Tottenham. Weirdly enough, he didn't get a red card for that little stunt, but he was suspended for four games. I can go on and on, but really, you guys get my point. It's easy to make the case that Super Mario shouldn't be allowed to make decisions for himself anymore. But then again, you know what? It's so much fun when he does. Here's what's next. In 2010, the French Non-Smokers Rights Association pretty much shocked the French nation with its anti-smoking ads that pretty much showed teenagers in a pose suggesting, let's just call it, um, oral delights. The campaign shows female and male teenagers with a cigarette in their mouths.